welcome to WooStream, bringing Willamette to you. Today's conversation features Sue Corner, Director of Recruitment for the College of Arts and Sciences here at Willamette University. As an alum herself, she graduated in 1990 with a major in English and double minors in Religious Studies and Psychology. Sue has spent almost three decades helping generations of students find their way to Willamette, and we're excited to discuss how you or your student can organize a college can organize a balanced and effective college search to find not just a place where they will fit um, and can gain admission, but a place where they will also thrive. Sue, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tiffany. I'm really happy to be here, and I so appreciate that people are tuning in and spending a summer evening thinking about all of this and taking time to interact in this way. Um, I am passionate about this topic. Um, and so as mentioned earlier, I have a lot of words to say about all of this and um, I hope it is helpful um, and I hope some of it makes sense for you at whatever age or stage you or your child are in this process. So um, I'm going to take just a second to share my screen um, so that everyone can see what I've put together here. Um, one second. Okay. So, organizing a balanced and effective college search. That's what we're talking about tonight. Um, Tiffany did a lovely job of introducing me, but just to reiterate for those who weren't a part of uh, last month's session, uh, the reason that somehow I am competent to be talking about what we're talking about tonight. Um, I have spent most of my 30 years since graduating from Willamette um, in the realm of higher education, the, the majority of that specifically in admission. And so I've spent a lot of time reading literally thousands of applications for admission and working very personally with lots of families as they've na navigated their college search. Um, so I, I hope that I'm speaking from a position of some experience um, in the things that I'm going to talk about tonight. I also happen to have three children. We have three children. One of them is a very recent college graduate. One of them is going to start her college experience this fall. Uh, and one is a rising junior in high school. So just from the parent perspective, I can relate <laughs> to what many of you are going through and have navigated that process with some. And just as a fun asterisk, my the daughter who is starting college this fall is going to be a bear cat. So my husband and I as bear cats ourselves are really excited about that. So tonight we're going to cover um, we're going to start with what's the goal of the college search and application process, which seems like a very basic thing, but you'd be surprised at um, the complexity of that question and that there can actually be lots of answers to that question. We're going to talk about what a balanced college search looks like and how it relates to the goal of the college application process. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how you organize a college search, some very basic ways that you narrow down your list. And then we're going to look at some of the activities and resources that are available to you and um, how those can serve you as you move through this process. So what is the goal of the college search and application process? When I do this workshop or a workshop like this in person in a, in a room actually filled with people, we have some interaction about this question. Um, I just ask, why are we going through this time consuming task of searching and applying to colleges to begin with? It's this giant thing that we add to our lives in the junior and senior year. It's stressful, it's big, and what are we hoping to achieve when it's all said and done? And when I ask that question, typically in a group of people who can actually interact, a number of answers are, are always come out and, and there are a number of appropriate answers to this question, what is the goal? Uh, the most common one is always, and rather obviously, it's to get into college. <laughs> we apply so that we can get in and gain acceptance. That's a, a really obvious and important response. Some will also bring up that they apply and search because they want to pursue a particular major. It's a certain area of study that they're really interested in and they, they want to find a way to think about that more at the college level. Some will mention just furthering their education. They want to be an educated person and they um, just really, it's, it's an obvious, clear 
this is what you do after high school. And so we search and we go on to higher education. Um, some will mention that the search is important um, in terms of finding the right social fit, finding people that um, you really want to connect with and have those lifelong college bonds with. And others will bring up a financial match that certainly part of the college search has to do with making sure that the place you access is a place that um, you can you can afford and that will not um, hinder you financially going forward in life. So lots of very common responses and many others that come up too. Um, but see, these are some of the most common I think that people think of when you stop and say, hmm, what is the goal of this process? There is one answer that rarely comes up that I in fact think is the most important goal. <laughs> and I think that because of the work that I do every day and what I see um, as the importance of higher education and what people are getting out of this whole time in their life. And yet people don't think of this as a goal at this stage in the process. The primary goal of the college search process is to earn your degree. We think of college <laughs> um, and attending classes as having a goal of earning your degree, but people forget that at the very beginning of this entire thing, you're actually, you should actually be thinking about completion and earning your degree. So going through the process of applying and searching is not actually just about getting in. It's about getting out at the end of four years, having earned a valuable degree that will influence and help launch you into a successful life and also having made lifelong connections and memories and friends along the way. It's about having a thriving experience that results in a degree. I don't think people always think of that. But it's really important. Simply getting into college doesn't get you very far. <laughs> you know, that when you stop and consider it, the getting in part is what people get so focused on they feel like it's a game. They feel like there should be tricks to what they need to do to get into this particular place or that particular place. And yet just the getting in really should not be the goal. The goal of, of searching is to complete and launch your life. And if all you do is get in but don't persist, then that launch really has essentially failed. So part of what I hope we'll discover tonight in the things that we talk about is this notion of not getting caught in the trap of thinking that the goal of this whole process um, begins and ends with college acceptance. It's much bigger than that. So in other words, you search and apply so you can both enter and complete college, which means that your college search, whether you're a sophomore, junior, senior in high school, whatever you're looking to be or your child is looking to be in this next year, the search is ultimately about whether or not you will retain and persist in that school that you choose. Now, there are some sobering statistics <laughs> that I'm gonna talk about for just a minute when we think about this idea of persistence and retention in college. These are from the National Center for Educational Statistics. 13% of students at community colleges complete an associate's degree in two years. 22% complete in three years. So taking 50% more time than they originally intended just still gets only to a 22% completion rate. 33% of public college students complete their bachelor's degree in the intended four years. That goes up to 57% or just over 57% if you expand it to a six-year time block. And 52% of private college students complete their four-year degree in four years, rises to 65% if you look at six years. So I don't know how you feel when you see those numbers, but to me, they're distressingly low. To me, they cause me to ask the question of why are these average retention statistics in colleges across the United States so low? Why are so many students failing to complete that goal of retaining and persisting and completing their degree? Why are students, you know, obviously going through the process of getting into college, but not staying and getting out? There's lots of reasons, lots of reasons that we can point to. Um, certainly students who make a poor academic or social fit with the college that they choose, um, that's a reason that they will leave and not persist. 
Um, many places have impacted classes, so, so students simply can't get the courses that they need to complete on time, and therefore they may ultimately complete, the, but they have to spend an extra year or even two to get done what they had hoped to get done in that four-year time frame. There might be a lack of support, whether that's financial, whether that's from faculty, whether that's from family. I think some students just find that the support that they need to be there to persist is not available. Some just simply fall through the cracks. <laughs> you know, some it could be for a variety of these reasons, um, but they just simply fall away. Sometimes it might just not be understanding and truly being committed to that goal of completing when they started. So lots of reasons why students don't persist. And what I think is important to ask then at this point in the process, when you're, when you're starting your college search or you're in the midst of your college search, is could those pitfalls that keep students from retaining, could they have been avoided if they'd been sleuthed out as part of the college search? So would persistence have been successful if students understood from the beginning that completion of their degree was an intentional and focused goal right from the beginning. So the way we're gonna address those questions is looking at what a balanced college search looks like. And I'm gonna take you through this idea of student retention theory um, to help you see why it's important to understand balance in college life um, even now, even before you apply, even before you narrow down your search. So there's a man named Vincent Tinto, Dr. Tinto, <laughs> who recently retired, um, but is sort of the nation's foremost expert on student retention theory. And he's the person who, in my work in higher ed, <clears throat> has really helped me to understand this idea that the college search is about accessing a place where you will thrive and stay and complete. Um, he, Tinto spent his entire career, a very long and very, very highly regarded academic career, um, looking at this idea of student retention and persistence. He did very, very long-term studies over the course of his career, um, thinking about why students persist in college. And he wrote some really um, important uh, pieces of writing about this topic as well. He really kind of set the bar for how we think about persistence and retention in the world of higher education. And his big question um, in all of this long-term research was, what is it that causes students to stay in college and thrive while they're there? Or conversely, what are the factors that cause them to leave college and not complete what they began? And in addressing this question over these very long-term and effective studies, Dr. Tinto really kind of boiled college life down to this very basic idea of these four quadrants. He said, if you take the life of a college student, and I think, um, I think high school students can kind of think of their life in this way too, it's a similar format, but he basically said, the life of a typical college student seeking their undergraduate degree can kind of divide everything they're doing during that intensive time of life into things that are either academic or things that are extracurricular. And then you can take those two buckets and kind of divide them one more time and say, within both of those realms, there are sort of formal activities and then there are informal activities. So we're gonna walk through very, very efficiently, I hope, <laughs> what these different quadrants look like and why they're important. So we'll start with the formal academic. What does the formal academic experience mean? And again, if we were all in the same room together, we would have some actual dialogue about this and I would have you throw out ideas of what you think um, fall into this particular quadrant. But since that's hard to do virtually, I will just give you all, <laughs> all of the answers. So the formal academic experience includes things like academic majors and disciplines that are available at any given school. It includes the day-to-day -day classes that students take part in um, and the faculty or professors who lead those classes. It includes campus-wide speakers, lectures, things of an academic nature that speak to what students are studying. Um, certainly research opportunities and the facilities um, that 
support those research opportunities. Anything that really is a formal part of the coursework, the study um, that is provided by the college, these are the things that make up the formal academic experience. At Willamette, I love to think about these things in terms of the Willamette experience, and I think for some alums, some of, some of these things might um, ring familiar. You know, I, I think about the professors of the, the Oregon professors of the year that um, teach at Willamette and the other incredible faculty that we have here. The class that we, the fact that we have small class sizes, we have incredible um, lab and other facilities that help students with their research and their in-class work. We have academic departments that are designed around hearths where students can study and gather and meet with faculty. We have an incredible college colloquium to kick off the freshman year and get students going um, on, the right, on the right foot. We have these amazing speakers that come in every year. Um, well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Maya Angelou don't come every year, but <laughs> um, every year there's, there are amazing people who come and speak to students and inspire them academically. Um, we have tremendous internship programs, um, some that happen at the State House, you know, some very unique things at Willamette that can, can kind of suggest what, what the formal academic experience would look like here. The informal academic experience, when I ask a, a group what falls in this box, I think sometimes it's a little bit harder to think about than the formal academic, but um, it, does, it does make sense, I think, when we start to think through it. The informal academic experience includes things like student-initiated study groups, so not something that's part of a class that's required, but just something that is very academic in nature, but it's entirely driven by the students themselves. It's informal because they get to choose it. Um, it's those spontaneous late night discussions that happen in your residence hall, you know, when students just get locked onto a topic and um, are excited to explore it and think together, even though it's not part of a class specifically. Um, it's something like sitting next to a professor and interacting with that person who's an important academic influence. Um, but you're doing that just at a campus event. It's in an informal kind of gathering space. Or being invited to a professor's home for a meal at the end of the semester or some point during the semester. This happens all the time at Willamette and that kind of informal academic experience is really special. Um, it's just sort of the campus culture around studying and attending class. It's that um, way that students in any given college um, atmosphere approach the idea of studying and the seriousness with which they take that or the lack of seriousness. It's different from place to place, but all of that falls into this idea of the informal academic. At Willamette, I think of things like the dogs that come in <laughs> that faculty and staff bring in during final exams for students who may want to pet a dog before they head into their test. Um, it's having pizza delivered to the chemistry hearth, you know, it's you're having an academic experience, but you're making it fun by having that food come in late at night. Um, meeting your study group at the bistro, you know, everybody loves the bistro back in the day and still. Uh, and so meeting to study, study there is certainly part of the informal academic experience. Departmental traditions or seeking support through things like the Writing Center or the World Languages Studio, um, those things fall into the informal experience. And just at Willamette, it's the academic culture, that informal academic culture of, mm, I can't do that on that day or at that time because I have class. It's a steadfast commitment to, we don't miss class here. Um, that is not the case at Willamette. It is, um, students are here to study first and foremost, and so everything revolves around that commitment to being in class, and that sort of presents itself as the informal academic culture. Formal extracurricular experiences, I think kind of like the formal academic are fairly easy generally for people to think of what falls into this quadrant. Um, things like music and theater events, whether that's something that a student is participating in or simply wanting to come be an audience member, um, those things are, are part of the formal extracurricular um, varsity and intramural athletics. Um, any student club and organization 
there's so many of them at Willamette. <laughs> uh, certainly student government falls into the formal extracurricular. Uh, residence life activities and opportunities, including Greek life activities. Um, certainly community service, which of course at Willamette is huge. These are all the kinds of things that fall into the formal extracurricular bucket. Um, at Willamette, some of the things that stand out to me are the our outdoor program, which is nationally recognized and offers 90 or more trips every year. Certainly ASWU and all of the amazing work they do both around kind of policy things for students at Willamette, but also activities and events. Um, our, our varsity athletic teams, which make up 25% of our student body, um, as well as our intramural teams and, and groups. Um, Clubs like Willamette Dance Company, it's entirely student run and it's our largest student organization. Events like the annual Luau and the social powwow that have been going on at Willamette for years and years, or just things like the traditions at Willamette. We don't, we don't have glee anymore, um, but we have late night breakfast during final exams where everybody, all of the faculty and staff go and serve breakfast to students as a study break. So wonderful things like that would all fall into this idea of what are the formal extracurricular experiences that the university is providing and supporting and funding for students um, as a part of their life in the college? And then the informal extracurricular, this is the box that I think is always the hardest for people when we really are trying to fill in what, what belongs here. This one can be the most elusive. The informal extracurricular is things like working out and exercising. It's what you do with your time when you're not in class or not doing something that's a formal extracurricular. Parties fall into this. Yes, parties happen. <laughs> we, those who are alums probably know that. Um, that would be part of the informal extracurricular experience. Any in, in student initiated tradition that is a part of campus culture or, or campus lore is the informal extracurricular. Um, things that students do just to explore the local community, whether it's walking downtown or getting out and about um, a little bit further in the Willamette Valley, those things fall into this bucket. Hanging out, it's just being together. <laughs> um, and it really, this box is what speaks to the culture of what's fun at a given institution. What do students do with their um, unassigned time where they just want to be relaxing and having fun and being together and building memories? That is what falls into the informal extracurricular experience. So, so these four boxes, I think, I hope they make sense. Um, oh, I forgot to talk about the ones that happen at Willamette. The informal extracurricular here, alums will remember being millstreamed on your birthday or that, that fun kind of student-initiated uh, tradition of being politely dipped in the millstream. Um, all of the myths and sort of lore that revolve around the star trees um, again, the bistro, hanging out at the bistro, um, that's part of the informal extracurricular. We had students initiate an opportunity a couple of years ago to break the Guinness World Record for the largest game of red light, green light. We actually did it twice because it was taken away from us in between and we went back and did it again. That kind of thing is not, you know, not mandated by the university. It's not a formal experience, but it was this tremendous informal extracurricular thing that brought the whole campus together. Running at Bush Park or bi biking in Minto Brown, uh, you know, those kinds of things that really explore the local community. Eating at this wonderful little spot, the kitchen on Court Street at two in the morning, that kind of thing that is really memory making. All of those things at Willamette fall into this, this particular bucket. So these four quadrants, I think, I think they make sense. I think once you talk through them like this, they're sort of logical in terms of being able to think of where all of these wonderful student experiences fall. And what happened with Dr. Tinto's research as he was looking at these four quadrants was over this long-term studies that he, were doing, that he was doing, he found that students who had meaningful content in all four of these quadrants of their college life those were the students who persisted. Having something, a few things that fill in each of these boxes, that's the recipe for a successful college experience. So students with all four quadrants are the most likely to thrive and learn and persist 
and, and complete their college degree and successfully launch into life. So that seems pretty simple to think about. That seems like something we can all go, okay, that's balanced, that makes sense. But if you think about where students and families focus most of their attention when they launch their college search, if you think about these four boxes, I'm sure if you could, if we were interacting right now and I asked which box do people place most of their attention to, uh, you would all say the formal academic. This is where everyone starts their college search. They're thinking about majors, they're thinking about what they wanna study, they're thinking about what that's going to mean in terms of their work ultimately. Um, this is where people focus and it's very, very logical to do so. Studying and classes and majors, that's the core of what we do in college. That's why we are here to begin with. So it, it's very, very logical. It's just one of the boxes. And the recipe includes all four boxes. <laughs> and when you add in statistics that would say over 80% of college students change their major. This is true across sizes and shapes and types of institutions. This is a national statistic. So it is very, very common for a student to change their major. And actually on average, students change their area of study three times. So if you allow this box to determine your entire college search, and then you change your major, or you've, you've used this box to determine where you want to be because you're so excited about a particular faculty member or a certain curriculum plan, and then that faculty member retires or the curriculum changes or there's something that changes you from that very specific academic focus, then the question is, are you at the right place? Have you put all your eggs in one basket and then suddenly you're no longer the right fit for your institution because you've discovered that your, that your interests have changed? So that's where most people start um, in terms of putting all of their attention in the college search. The other box that people tend to really focus on um, probably too much is the formal extracurricular. <laughs> um, and this, I, in my experience, has been most specifically with student athletes or student artists of some sort, musicians or um, actors or students who have a really keen interest in, in the arts as an extracurricular pursuit. They can really, really focus on that as part of their college search. Um, but again, you have to ask the question, what if you're a student athlete and you focused entirely on um, this part of your life as to drive your college search, then what happens if you have a career ending injury and you can no longer participate? Or what happens if that choir director that you so wanted to study with as, a, you know, as an extracurricular pursuit, what if they leave? Or they bring in somebody who's better than you at your part or your position? Are you still at the right place? Are you still engaged fully? Um, what if you just are not as committed to that extracurricular pursuit a few years into your college experience and you've chosen a school specifically because of it? You may find yourself then not being the right fit that you thought you would be. The box that I think gets the least amount of tension, attention or is probably the least understood is the informal extracurricular box. And yet I think it's the quadrant that probably deserves the most attention in some ways. I think when we see students who really thrive and get the most out of their college experience and just absolutely um, take advantage of everything that's available to them. They are the students who when they choose Willamette and they they have the opportunity to tell us on their acceptance why they're choosing Willamette, they say things like, it just felt right. You know, the minute I walked onto campus, I felt like I'd found my people. Um, it was just this gut feeling and I could see myself there. This is all speaking to that kind of informal, extracurricular culture or community and it's really hard for people to get their heads around this because it's not very quantifiable it's hard to check off on a you know on a list <laughs> and yet it is really important when it comes to making a choice that will speak to the right fit so 
Again, the recipe for a truly successful college experience, according to this long-term study that was done by Tinto, is having meaningful content in all four of these boxes. It's having things that keep you engaged and keep you interested and help you thrive in all of these different realms of college life. So if you understand that, if you understand the importance of this recipe before you launch into your college search, before you begin, then I think you can look at your search in a far more balanced way where you're considering all of these areas. You're not getting yourself stuck in just one of the boxes. You're not focusing so narrowly on one piece that you or on one quadrant um, that that then might set you up for a lack of success. So knowing all of that, now that you are experts in student retention theory and you understand why that's important when it comes to college persistence, the question becomes, so how do you take that kind of self-assessment and that approach that is balanced and, and how do you organize your search? And this is really a pretty simple concept. There are, there are three main ways that people narrow down their college search. There are three main categories that students use to take the 3,200 colleges, at least in the United States, certainly more if you're looking across the globe. But if you're thinking in the US, 3,200 colleges, you have to start narrowing it down somehow. So how do you do that? There are three main ways. The first is simply geography. You ask yourself, where in the world do I want to be for the next four years of my life? Where do I want to spend this really important learning and growth time? I think it's important for people to understand that it's extremely common and okay to stay close to home. Most people do. Certainly more than half of the people in college in the US today um, stay within 100 miles of where they grew up. 72% um, stay in state, and a fairly small percentage actually go more than 500 miles away. I say all of that not because I think everybody should stay close to home, not by any means, um, but I do think sometimes students uh, feel some sort of pressure that they need to go far away, that that's the norm, and that going to college means going far away. And in fact, that, that isn't the case for many, and, and there are lots of good reasons why many make the choice to stay relatively close to home. Sometimes those decisions are driven by finances. They sometimes are driven by um, just health and support issues. Whatever it might be, there's lots of good reasons that you don't need to feel pressure to go far, far away. Others certainly feel like college is just a great time to explore a new part of the world or a new part of the country. And, and it's kind of a finite time in your life when you can say, hey, I'm gonna go somewhere, I know it's not forever, so it's a, it's a perfect time to go try on something new, knowing that it's, you're not making a commitment that will last forever necessarily. Um, so it's fun to think about that too, and to really ask yourself that question of what you want. Some students know they want to still be on the West Coast if this is where they live. Others know they wouldn't thrive in a place that's snowy half the year. You know, thinking about all of those things, um, uh, is is important and I think if students are honest with themselves they can really start narrowing that big list down just by thinking about where they know they would would like to be geographically I also think um, I, I often hear students who will talk about wanting to be somewhere because it's a certain city you know they want to go to New York because New York is exciting and has amazing things going on or LA um, and that's certainly true for a lot of students for many college students, the bulk of their life happens on campus. <laughs> they should be choosing a place that is thriving both academically and extracurricularly in a way that gives them certainly some opportunity for those informal um, extracurricular activities that allow them to get out into the region, but um, much of what they're doing is on campus. So really fixating on a certain city, I think sometimes is a mistake. So thinking geographically, that's the first way people will narrow down the list. The second is by institutional size. You know, this is um, certainly not a perfect formula, but there are some basic differences. I think if you're just using a broad brush, um, you can think about some very basic 
differences between large and small institutions that might help a student think about what, what they really want. Larger institutions, you can kind of generally say they just there's a lot more people, there are more majors or programs generally, there's lots and lots of clubs and organizations. They have the big college sports that for some students are really important um, as just a part of the social part of campus. Sometimes those would, some would say that the, you know, the downside of a large institution is that there's a little bit less connection, um, certainly in the classroom. Professors aren't always the ones who teach, it's very often assistants. Um, classes can be pretty big, and so that may or may not work with someone's learning style. Um, and I think some would suggest that there can be a, a loneliness or anonymous feeling sometimes, um, almost surprisingly, at a place where there are so many people. It can, it can be harder sometimes to make the connection. Small institutions, again, just in very broad strokes, the advantages can be those small classes where faculty know you, where discussion is deep, you're not anonymous, um, you're able to ask questions, uh, you can have a leadership impact generally because there's so much opportunity. Um, the disadvantages of the small school would be, for some it's just not enough new people, there's just not enough of a, of a group there to keep things exciting. Um, often small schools are in smaller towns or cities and that can feel isolating to some students um, or it can feel just a little bit too confining to be in a community that's small. So these are very, again, very, very broad strokes, very basic things to consider. But I do think when a student is honest with him or herself and really thinks about Am I a big school person or a small school person? If they really think about their own learning style, um, the way they like to interact and the, the kinds of things that have been important to them in their high school experience academically or the things that they feel have been missing in their high school experience, I think they really can start to whittle down to feeling like one or the other of the institutional types is a better fit for them. And then the third way that people narrow down their search is, again, going back to that idea of the major, the field of study, that really that formal academic piece. Um, we know we don't want to focus on it exclusively, but it is an important thing to factor in. It's fun to think about what academic areas excite you. It's good to not confine yourself um, too narrowly, I think. Tinto would say, don't do that. Um, but it is fun to think about all of the different things that you're interested in and, and make sure that the places you're looking at have those offerings. I think it's practical to think about major or field of study in terms of how that's going to return on your investment and you're going to have an opportunity beyond your college life um, to thrive. But again, you want to remember when focusing on this piece that 80% statistic that suggests that people change their mind. Um, and, and so you don't want to narrow things so dramatically that you find yourself at the wrong institution. You don't want this to be the sole driver of narrowing your search. So really, those are very basic things. Geography, institutional size, field of study, these are the three ways that people really take that big giant group of 3,200 colleges and start to say, how do I get my arms around this? So <clears throat> I'm talking just so much. There's so much to say. But <laughs> what we've already gone through is you have your goal. You know now that we've talked about this, that truly the goal of the college search process is to actually stay in college and complete your degree. You know from Dr. Tinto's quadrants that approaching this search in a balanced way where you're looking beyond just the formal academic part of things and you're looking really at a comprehensive student life sort of approach, that, that that's really important. And now you know these general areas of how to organize by really thinking very, very self-reflectively about where you want to be geographically, what size of institution you think fits your learning style, and what majors you'd like to explore. We've got all of that, and so that leaves us with the final question of what activities and resources are available to you? How do you then take all of this introspection and thinking and balancing and focused on goals, how do you take all of that and then jump in to your actual college search? 
and <laughs> this is going to seem very unenlightened, I'm sure, but you just start, you just jump in. <laughs> you, you pick a place, some place that meets some of those basic categories for you. And whether it's virtual or in person in this, in this year, you start interacting. There are so many things that are available to you um, from colleges right now. You can take a tour, you can listen to an information session, you can request a one-on-one -on -one interview with your admission counselor and have an actual conversation. You can attend an open house or some other sort of event. You can sit in on a class. Um, you can speak to an alum. Many places have, have robust um, programs that, that allow you to speak with an alum. You can look for ways to interact with current students. There are all kinds of things available. You just have to kind of Take a breath and jump into it and start somewhere. Some sort of interaction with a college of, of any size or configuration will lead to a next step of interaction, whether it's with, with that college or with another. And each interaction that you have will inform further for you what you want and what you like and what you don't like and what you think you want to explore next. It all builds on itself. Um, and so you just have to jump in and start somewhere. I um, frequently tell people who are struggling to figure out where to enter this process and how to get, get organized about it. I frequently will say, you know, look close to home and find an institution that's small and an institution that's large and make some sort of appointment to do some sort of activity at both places. Even if you absolutely know that neither of those places is going to be your ultimate destination, just getting a sample of what a small liberal arts college looks like and then, and then getting a taste of what a larger state institution looks like. Just doing those two things can really, really inform those next steps and can then help you decide, okay, what other institutions of this type do I want to look at? Or do I want to cross this type of institution off my list because I know it's not for me? Um, just taking that step is really important. And I, I frequently over the years have talked with, <laughs> with parents who are struggling to help their student um, get excited about the college search. I think they often feel overwhelmed and the parent is struggling to get the student to do any of the things that they're, um, that they'd like them to do. And I think just, just um, convincing that student to do one thing, just one, that's all you're asking them to do. Take one tour. It's shocking how often just one interaction will kickstart the student. And, and their excitement will build. And then this parent doesn't have to do any more of the work, then the student takes it from there. It really just takes getting on one campus to, to get things rolling. So just start interacting. And then use the resources that are available. There are so many. Um, colleges visit high schools all over the country, all throughout the fall. All of my colleagues, this is what we do. We leave our families at home and we spend months out on the road every fall visiting high schools and talking with interested um, prospective students. This year, it's gonna look a little bit different. We're gonna be doing a lot of that virtually, but we will still be visiting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of high schools this fall. And lots of other colleges will be doing that as well. So being attuned to what's happening at your own school and looking for those opportunities to interact with somebody who's in the admission office um, is a really smart thing to do. Certainly being tapped into your school's college counselor and the college counseling center. I know not every school has a dedicated college counselor, but pretty much every school has a college counseling center of some sort that has good information um, and making use of those resources is important. There are lots of different search en engines online that can help you organize a search and um, help you find like institutions to those that you are starting to focus on. I particularly like Big Future by the College Board. Um, CapEx, I think, also does a good job. So either of those, if you just search those, you'll find these tools that can help you organize. I even think the common application, which is 
um, an application form that many, many colleges throughout the US use. The Common App itself, um, you can create a little account for it, and it is a great way to search for colleges too. It allows you to look at the different requirements. It allows you to really understand one school versus another in some pretty important ways. So I think even using the Common App is good. Um, for old people like me, you know, I still like actual books, <laughs> not just everything online. And I think there are some good guides out there that are written that are still very, very effective. Um, uh, Lauren Pope's series of books, uh, Looking Beyond the Ivy League, and then Colleges That Change Lives, those two books by Lauren Pope and his colleagues are incredibly helpful resources, particularly for families who are trying to think about the, the liberal arts experience. Um, very, very good guides to take a look at. And then the Fisk guide has been around forever, but of all of the guides that really tries to look comprehensively at all colleges, I think Fisk does um, a vastly superior job of taking in both data and anecdotal information and effectively using both. Some focus far too much just on data and it can really, really skew the actual perception of the student experience and others look just at student experience and don't take any numbers into account. So FISC balances those very well. College fairs can be helpful. You know, we all attend college fairs, college reps do, um, because it's a chance, even if it's quick, it's a chance to actually meet with someone one-on-one -on -one and, and talk just a little bit about, about the institution. So there will be lots of virtual college fairs this year, um, and those are worth taking advantage of. And then I think sometimes people forget that just the people in your life are resources too. Friends, neighbors, relatives, even just acquaintances. Um, there's nothing like speaking with someone who has attended an institution and who can give you their perception of what that experience was like. And I think sometimes students can be really shy about doing this. They feel silly asking someone they don't know very well to tell them about their college experience. But I guarantee that people love to talk about it and people will be honest. And it's meaningful to, you know, knock on that neighbor's door and say, you know, I'm interested in Duke and I heard that you went there. I wondered if you would have any time to tell me about it. And that person will be very happy to do so. It's just um, something that can be really, really meaningful. So don't be afraid to use any sort of resource like that to help inform. It's all of these things together, layered together, that help students really find their way to the right place. And then of course, stay connected with Willamette as a resource. Um, you know, I'm biased about helping students find their way to this particular place, <laughs> but I have helped lots and lots of families over the years with their college search generally, and I've helped lots and lots of children of alumni with different pieces of this process too. So I love it when an alum emails me and says, hey, Sue, we're filling out our application to such and such a place, and I I'm not sure how we should categorize the activities. Is there a, you know, is, is there a key to that? Is there something that we should consider that I'm not thinking about? Or, hey, we're getting ready to forecast for my seniors' um, classes, and is, is it more beneficial to take this math class versus this math class? I'm always really happy to answer those questions. Any of my colleagues here in the office are. Um, but but that's a service that I feel as alumni is, is due you <laughs> um, from those of us who work in admission and, and we're really, really happy to help. So consider me, consider the Office of Admission here a resource to you um, in this whole process. And then that URL that's showing right now on the screen, the virtual visit guide, that will take you to the opportunities that we're sharing right now. Um, in terms of college search sorts of activities. Some of them are specific to Willamette. Some of them are very general in terms of just trying to help students with their, with their search um, generally. So using us in that way and taking part in some of our other activities can be really helpful too. So that was a lot of me talking. <laughs> um, 
took a little longer than I expected. Um, but we have some time. I certainly have time to answer questions for people who have them. Um, and it, he has answered some of those questions. Yeah, we have a few here. Um, the one that I'm going to start off with, and thank you for all that different inf information. I know it really hit me when you said, like, I found my place. My own college experience was like that. And so much of it was about the perceptions students and families have of the institutions they're you know, assessing. I wonder if you could also speak a little bit about, you know, how that institution might be perceived in the wider culture. So, you know, do reputation and brand or name recognition matter? Is that something people should also kind of weigh as they're looking into this? You know, we live in a culture where name recognition and brand is really important, I think. And so it's hard to it's certainly hard to ignore that. There's a tremendous book um, out right now called um, Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be. And it's a terrific read for college searching students and I think particularly for parents. Um, and, you know, I think you can't ig ignore the name part of, of where you end up, but I think people get far too wrapped up in that piece. And that does not speak to Tinto's retention theory at all. You didn't name recognition or name brand anywhere in that recipe for thriving and success and completing a degree. So I think that has to be um, factored in very, very carefully. And, and it can be hard, It can depending on the school, that students are attending depending on the culture of the parent group in different high schools. Um, it, there can be a lot of pressure for students to think only about a certain set of schools or only about schools that have certain statistics. And I would caution people to think very seriously about the fact that, you know, a low acceptance rate um, doesn't have anything to do with students' persistence or students' um, overall experience. Um, the quality of faculty, the quality of the student body, the engagement of the student body, those are the things that speak to a thriving, successful college experience. They don't have anything to do with those numbers. So, so I think you have to hold that that piece in a very careful spot as part of this search and kind of buck some of the cultural norms if you can. Yeah. Um, an another big piece of this, like you said, is the fact that, you know, we're currently in a pandemic and that might be affecting our ability to go visit campuses or to participate in some of those activities you listed. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak on how that might, the, the continued distance learning might impact the admissions process and also people's ability to kind of suss this out for themselves and, and get that feeling. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to be hard. It's going to be different than it's ever been before. So I think we're all in uncharted territory here. Um, I do think that colleges, all of my colleagues across the country that I'm in touch with are, have been doing nothing but trying to figure out how to share virtual experiences for rising juniors and seniors who are really trying to figure out this college search business. So um, there are opportunities that didn't exist six months ago to explore places, at least initially, through a virtual experience. And so I think taking advantage of those can be really, really helpful. Nothing's the same as actually being at a place and walking around, um, but you can get a pretty good sense of who the students are and what the faculty are like and what the priorities are of an institution if you start taking advantage of some of those sessions that are available. So I, I think, and you know, depending on what this fall looks like for, for students, if they're at home more, <laughs> as we expect many of them will, will be, there might be more time and energy to do some of that and to actually you know, virtually visit more places than they would have been able to if they were trying to do it all in person. So I think taking advantage of that, especially this fall, is going to be important. And then I, I think we all have our fingers crossed that spring might allow for a little bit more of that in person. And certainly for seniors going through the application process with a thought that 
in the spring, once they know where they're admitted, as they're really getting to that point of trying to make a decision, hopefully at that point, there will be opportunity to physically visit those places that have risen to the top of the list and to really confirm that decision by a visit at that point, as opposed to starting with a physical visit. Um, I, I'm going to retain hope that we will be able to, to offer that to students this year. Um, so, and, and I think trying to set aside those fears about what, what COVID is doing in terms of um, the transcript for lots of students, you know, transcripts are gonna look really different. There's gonna be lots of pass-fail grades instead of actual grades. There's going to be students who would have been really involved in certain extracurricular pursuits who now can't be. There are lots of things about that application that are, that are, going, to be, that are going to look different. Um, and we're very prepared for that. We know that and students need to let go of stress about that idea and recognize that everybody's in the same boat and where the admission people are very ready to, to deal with that. So hopefully that won't be a huge additional source of anxiety. Yeah, so much of that is going around. Um, so a, another person asks a little bit about the fact, like if you have a student who's already looking at the next thing, not just undergraduate, but then grad school, or in this particular case, law school, are there any specific pros or cons in considering the same school, like Willamette, which does mm -hmm. have, you know, our College of Law, um, but I, I wondered if you could kind of give your two cents on that. Yeah, I, I, that's a, it's a great question. I think, um, <laughs> I think the thing that comes up first when I think about that is we see a trend right now where a lot of students are um, really good, really good high school students might be coming out of their high school experience with some um, credit already under their belt. They might have taken IB courses or exams or AP exams um, or some dual credit that have given them college credit. And many really, really motivated students are thinking, hey, I'm going to do that program so that I can then do um, my four-year degree in less time because I'm really focused on getting on to uh, law school or medical school or whatever it might be. And <laughs> that's a really understandable, um, motivated student. And yet we're seeing trends where particularly with medical school, um, they're not interested in students who have rushed through and shortchanged their actual four-year college preparation. They, it, is, it is of concern to them to look at admitting someone who's only been in their undergraduate institution for three years, um, or sometimes even less than that, two and a half years. So, um, so I think there's a caution there. I think in terms of looking at an undergraduate school where you can also stay to do your graduate program, I think there are some huge advantages to that particularly if you're thinking about a program like we offer where there's opportunity to kind of combine those programs. I think that can be a really efficient and effective way to complete two degrees. I also think when we see students doing those de combined degrees at Willamette, it's, um, it's the student who has come as an undergraduate and has truly fallen in love with the opportunities here, with the culture here, um, with the understanding that you know, for law school, we're, we're situated so beautifully in terms of being right in the heart of the state capitol. Um, there's so much lovely consistency that then can happen if you stay and do your graduate program here. So I think being aware of those opportunities, even as one applies for their undergraduate degree, is really, really smart. I also think remembering and being okay with that idea that people change their minds. Students, once they get to their undergraduate institution, often change their academic course. And so allowing yourself the flexibility to know that that's okay is really important and not having told yourself and every single person that you know that you're going to both, you know, undergraduate school and law school at Willamette and that's a set deal. Um, I think I think you allow yourself more freedom to really explore where you should be if you if you don't consider yourself so locked in. Mm -hmm. And we also have the, the Atkinson Graduate School of Management. Absolutely. Yep. 
um, Claremont School of Theology is coming on board hopefully here in the next year or so, but it's so important to look at all those different offerings on a campus to see kind of what makes sense. And speaking of offerings, I know one of the things that I myself looked at and, and um, we hadn't mentioned a lot was student services. Like that, that can be another big um, source of resources for students to help them in retaining and persisting. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how you can find out about what student services are, are available and, and what those can look like. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, <laughs> this is my perspective as someone who works at a small liberal arts college where I think we do so the support side of things really, really well. Um, so my bias will come through a little bit here, but I think, um, it's, it's hard to fall through the cracks at a small school where there are resources that help with tutoring and with writing and with um, quantitative analysis and with foreign language acquisition and um, with student study groups and really, really incredible academic advising that comes directly from full faculty. You know, all of those things are so robustly in place at small colleges um, it's very easy to find those resources on websites, and it's certainly easy to ask very specific questions about those sorts of things through the admission counselors at, at different colleges, especially at the small schools. We are very happy to connect people with those resources. If a student has a learning difference and they want to understand how that will be supported um, in their college experience, we can be a direct connector to the person who would see them through that plan and help them make accommodations, um, that's something that we happily and easily do all the time. Beyond that, and especially at larger institutions where those things might be a little bit harder to, to find, again, I think starting with admission and saying, where can you point me is a, is a good place to start. Um, and then I think just availing yourself of some of those visit opportunities where you can directly ask questions, that's really important too. Wonderful. Um, another thing that you mentioned briefly was the return on investment. And I'm wondering if, if there's any place where people can find out more information on how you assess that or look at that. Because I know it's not just numbers and salary and, you know, career attainment, that kind of thing. But are there sources of information to get a little bit more context around that? Oh, that's a good question. There are different there are a million different lists. You know, you can just search the best college um, value, the best college return on investment. You can find all kinds of lists out there. Um, I think some of them use really sound um, math and, and uh, analysis to come to their conclusions. I think others do a very poor job of looking at actual um, outcomes. So I think the best place to really look and start to try to assess that sort of thing is trying to connect with the career center um, or the alumni office. I think these are the places in a college campus where you can get both anecdotal and data-driven um, information about outcomes. And, and I do think it's really, really important to think about that. Um, this is an incredible investment of an important time in a young person's life. It's an incredible investment of a family's resources these days more than ever. And so understanding what that investment of time and energy and money is going to look like on the other side of things is really, really important. And so speaking with alumni, looking at what the Career Services Office offers and what their data says about what people are doing out in the world with their Willamette degree or whatever degree um, is, is probably the best place to start. And another part of this assessment, which I, pardon me for continuing to use that word, is really looking at the campus climate from the perspective maybe of a student that's from an underrepresented or marginalized group, whether they're first generation, they're a student of color, um, maybe they identify in the LGBTQI communities, um, are there things that those students could look at when they're looking at a campus to make sure it might be a safe place for them or an affirming place or have things that meet their needs and are aware of their particular situations? 
Absolutely. I mean, I think the the words that you hear most often these days on college campuses, the language that is being used most, I think, is that um, equity, diversity, and inclusion piece. So on any given college website, putting equity, diversity, and inclusion into the search bar and seeing what comes up, that will often direct you to multicultural resources, um, student groups, um, commentary or articles that have been written, that that's a place where you can start to get a sense of the place in terms of those important issues. I do think looking at numbers in this particular um, category is really important and understanding um, what does the diversity um, makeup of a campus look like in, in all the ways that diversity is defined. Um, and those statistics are available on, on every campus's website. So understanding how you might fit in in whatever subgroup that you are a part of and understanding how, how those numbers look is, is worth searching and, and generally pretty easy to find. Um, I also think, again, it, there's nothing like interacting as a, as a prospective student, um, there's nothing like interacting with a current student. And so as you're seeking those opportunities to take a tour or sit in on a class or whatever it might be, trying to find opportunities within those activities to talk to a student and to say, how would I fit in, at, you know, given who I am, how would I fit in at Willamette or what's the climate like, or, you know, asking those important questions is, is a really good thing to do. And I think in many cases for parents, there is opportunity to ask those questions of parents also. And that can be very comforting. And, and in my experience, and I suspect yours too, Tiffany, and what you do, um, parents of current students are very, very helpful. They're very honest. They're willing to say the places where their student might have struggled, and they're willing to say this is where the institution has absolutely knocked it out of the park. And so seeking those opportunities, too, as the parent of a prospective student um, to, to find that parental interaction is, is a great thing to do. We offer those opportunities during our spring events for admitted students. We also offer them often mid-year, kind of while students are still um, applying through a program called Woo to You, where we go to certain cities and, and include student, student parents in that. Um, so those are good opportunities to look for as well. And just speaking um, from my role as a director of graduate alumni engagement, I want people online to know and who watch this later that we do have a thriving alumni board and a parent leadership council. So those are alumni and parents, current or former, who are actively engaged in school leadership, in kind of being the sounding board for us, in hosting a bunch of different events. And I'm happy to again make the link. Um, to those resources if people have questions if they want to talk to someone or to alumni we, we have a list of alumni who regularly mentor or come to class to speak and really we're happy to make connections or you can look on LinkedIn and kind of see if, if there's someone you'd really like to talk to whose experiences might kind of match with what you're interested in and we would be happy to um, help make those you know build those bridges and make sure everyone gets their questions answered in this process. Um, we have one more question that's a little bit of um, a pivot and it's about, again with resources, do you have suggestions for scholarship searches? I know we talked about this a little bit in part one, but um, I was wondering if you could share a little more. So, um, <laughs> oh, the, the financial part of this is, is probably the trickiest part of all. You know, there are lots of ways to get our heads around everything else, but the financial piece is, is these days what I think can stop people in their tracks, and, and it's tricky. Um, I think Big Future, that is the college search engine, can, can help direct students toward financial resources as well, as can CapEx. Those search engines that help you narrow down their, the list also direct students toward um, different opportunities to find resources. Um, I think within each state, it looks a little bit different, but depending on where you are attending high school, um, there are often state-based resources 
that um, can open you up to a number of different scholarship opportunities. In Oregon, it's called OSAC. If you um, tap into OSAC, you apply one time and then you're um, eligible to be considered for, I don't know, it's like 2000 different scholarships. So looking within your state at what that resource might be, I think often many of those kinds of awards go unclaimed, no one applies for them. Sometimes they are very specific in terms of who those awards um, are el available to, who's eligible for them. So you have to take the time to tap in. Um, but if you do, you may be one of few who's actually applying. So looking to your um, college counseling center at your high school and asking where those resources live in your home state. It doesn't mean you have to go to school in your home state. It just means that those resources are there. So looking for those is, is another good way um, to tap in. And then, um, you know, if you've narrowed your search down to a reasonable number of schools and you really think you kind of have an idea of where you're going to apply, really delving into those individual institutions and understanding what their criteria are for financial resources, um, you know, are you automatically considered for uh, need-based aid or what do you need to do to be considered for need-based aid at each institution that you're looking at? Um, are you automatically considered for merit-based aid or do you need to check a certain box or take a certain step to be considered for merit aid? Does that institution even offer merit aid? Or does the merit aid only exist in terms of certain kinds of talent awards or things that are accessible only through a special and additional application? Um, you really want to look for those things as well. And that can be um, time consuming um, because it can vary widely from institution to institution. So in my opinion, this is a place where parents can be a really good support to the application process. It's totally appropriate for parents to do some of that searching. It's not appropriate for parents to complete the application. It's not appropriate for parents to do the interview. You know, there are lots of things that really need to be the student. Um, but some of the research pieces, especially when it comes to dollars, can be a great thing that, that parents can do to save their students some time and to help direct them. Well, we have covered so much. We only have a couple minutes left. So I wanted to ask if there's anything else that kind of comes to mind as we're thinking about this, you know, organized and balanced search process. Are you asking for other questions or anything? Oh, oh for you, for you. Sorry. Oh. We're just wrapping up, kind of. Sorry. You know, um, no, no, that's great. You know, the other, the, I guess the other thing that I would say is the final session in the series is going to look at, um, you know, the kind of the pitfalls that I see students fall into when they actually complete their application. And then those things that students can do to really, really prepare themselves well to, to put together a great application. So we'll talk through those very specific elements in the final session. Um, I think both as a parent as an, and as a professional, um, what I see as the, um, <laughs> the hardest part of all of this is that students allow themselves to get um, behind in the process and then it all becomes overwhelming and rushed and stressful. And so I think, and I mentioned this in the first part of the series, so I think as families, anything that you can do to try to spread out the process, to manage it in reasonable bites, <laughs> you know, to get through um, in a way that's, that's organized and manageable, it allows this to be a really self-reflective and rewarding process. It doesn't have to be stressful and scary and overwhelming. It can be very, very rewarding and a time when students really get to look at themselves and, and feel great about all they've accomplished and all they're um, getting to prepare to do next. But some of that goes out the window if you wait too long um, <laughs> or if you don't take things kind of in a logical order. So I just really encourage people to, to spread it out, to be organized, and that will um, that'll make all the difference. 
I think persistence should be the the hashtag that we're going for. Just exactly get it. Um, so Sue, yeah. once again, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and insights on this process. I know it's very helpful for prospective students and families, the families of alumni who are also helping navigate a student through this. Um, so thank you so much. And to everyone who joined us, I just want to say we appreciate you spending some time with us. If you enjoyed this discussion, we hope you'll check out the other content on Ustream. Um, and then we will just thank you for um, being with us. And we hope everyone stays healthy and we'll see you online in August. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody.